Hi, I'm Guy Andrews and this is Guy's Garage. This is a show about everything that guys love. I want to do a little bit of uh, little bit of homework before we start and introduce our, our next guest. But guys, I really need subscribers on the YouTube channel. If we're going to keep this thing rolling, we've got to get lots of subscribers. So when you watch it, hit that subscribe button. Follow us on uh, on Facebook at just Guy's Garage and Instagram at Guy's underscore garage underscore so, uh, yeah, give us a follow on all those platforms and uh, we'll get this story out there. So Guys Garage is all about everything guys love and having a good time, reviewing lots of fun things and the podcast, uh, introducing some uh, fantastic guests and stories to you all. Also, Guys Garage is about men's health and men's issues, including prostate cancer and mental health for everybody, especially for men. So we're focusing on men and Speaking of men, I have a man in my studio right now, a fella who I've actually had the f- uh, been fortunate enough to work with a little bit, uh, a V8 enduro driver, probably one of the best enduro drivers uh, in the in the country. Uh, he's been going around in the motorsport industry for uh, quite a few years now, and I can't wait to hear about his uh, his story. Uh, just like to welcome Warren Luff. G'day, buddy. How are you? Good to see you, mate. <laughs> Good to catch up, finally. Good thing about these podcasts is all these busy mates of mine I get to actually catch up with, <laughs> so it's it's actually pretty hard to these days. You must get that. You get super busy, hey, and it's hard to sort of carve out time for, for your old mates and you know, family and stuff. Yeah, it is. Like, it's uh, you know what it's like. You sort of, uh, most of the year is spent sort of uh, traveling and obviously working and, and doing all that sort of stuff, and obviously now, like yourself, with a, with a young family, obviously both our daughters are only a couple of months apart. It's yeah, just um, three and a half, eh? It's crazy just how the year just sort of just blends into one. You sort of get to the end of the year, and um, and ev- even like earlier today, I was just chatting to a mate of mine, and um, he's a motoring journal, just lives uh, not too far from down here, and same thing, just catching up, and we're both like, look, yeah. we've been slack, haven't had a chance to catch up. and uh, That's tough, hey? I mean, yeah. uh, uh, you know, social media is good. You can so- kind of keep in contact with friends, but you don't really actually catch up face to face. Did you notice, enough on the, the camera, for the people that are watching on YouTube, I've, I've just gotten rid of all the glitter and makeup from uh, <laughs> for my daughter from a couple of hours ago. She was practicing on my face so I bet you get a bit of that have you ever, ever had that experience mate yeah she's sort of at that age now where like she's uh discovered sort of uh makeup and all 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 things very girly and all that sort of stuff so uh yeah, that's yeah cool. like trying to sort of uh even do her hair every morning she's like I've got to brush daddy's hair first obviously yeah, yeah, you, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, well yeah Alex doesn't get to do that with my hair unfortunately but yeah she but could do yours yeah yeah no she uh tries to put it into ponytails and do all sorts of weird stuff but no uh, it's, it's a good fun age yeah it is mate tell us a little bit about your history I know you're uh, well, at least second generation. Your dad, Ian, uh, is an amazing car guy and has been around the car motoring industry forever. Is it, 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 give us some background on how that all come about, and I'm actually interested to know: does it go back further than that? Um, no, look, I suppose in in terms of our family, sort of dad was sort of the first one to sort of get involved in cars and driving and racing. Sort of grandma and grandpa sort of uh, were never sort of into that. Grandpa was a photographer. Grandma was a stay-at-home mum. So it was dad that really sort of became the sort of first person that had a real interest in cars. But funnily enough, so did his uh, his sister. So my auntie, she also yeah. back in the sort of the, the late 70s, early 80s, wasn't actually a bad steerer herself. Did she do racing? Yeah, or? well, she did She did a lot of super sprints out of Amaru sort yeah. of uh, when her and her husband first moved to yeah. to Sydney from Melbourne. She had a, uh, a GDR XU1 Tirana with all the sort of the hot bits on it and everything <laughs> like that. So uh, awesome. it was it's, it's interesting because um, my dad liked cars, but he wasn't a car guy like you know like I ended up being. Was there a moment or something that sort of turned your dad on? And obviously you're different because you're second generation. We'll get into that. But did, did your dad ever recall that moment that switched him onto cars? I don't think for him there was ever one sort of moment. It was always just a, a passion for him of, of cars and speed. And um, like even when he first got his license and um, I think he even started on a motorbike um, and he was trying to sort of convince uh, Grandpa that uh, the bike that he wanted to get um, that uh, that I think it was like a 650 or something like that. But like <laughs> Grandpa was like, no, 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 yeah. you can't get the 650 and all this sort of stuff. Um, and then eventually Grandpa sort of conceded and sort of the deal that they made was the he'd only use half throttle 
So, <laughs> yeah, so that was <laughs> yeah, sure, that, Grandpa. That, that, that was their deal because I think Grandpa no secret, data logging back then. No, right? no data logging. But I think Gra- Grandpa secretly wanted to have a ride of the bike as well. And yeah, uh, yeah. his words to Dad were, "Look, you can get the bike, but you can only use half throttle." Yeah, so of course, yeah. Dad so agreed to So he used the second half. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, the back half. I know another joke like that, but we won't say that. Well, maybe we could at Sky's Garage, but anyway. <laughs> We uh, <laughs> we'll move on. So tell me more. So you so you're a young fellow. You're growing up. Your dad's into the cars. So paint the picture for us. Yeah. Look. Um. Look. Dad was involved in cars and and motorsport from even before I was born. But um, from when he moved to Sydney, sort of like in the mid seventies, uh, he started working for Peter Werrett at the Peter Werrett Driving School. Yeah. Uh, and eventually, famous then, name, that, fa- famous name in uh, in both cars and obviously motoring industry and everything. Uh, and then Dad went out on his own and started his own driving school. So literally from like when I was a kid dad was based out of Oran Park for sort of over 30 years um, so I was out of Oran Parks from a, as young as I can ever remember and I started driving cars like when I was eight and nine years of age around Oran Park do you miss Oran Park yeah can you I believe it's gone well I can't believe that it's gone but the funny thing is my sister actually lives in the the housing oh, the estate, estate. Oh, well, that's, in, that's in, in the estate that's actually there almost. but like about six months ago I went for a drive out that way when I was in Sydney I hadn't been out to Oran Park since it actually closed like did, did they keep any of the shape there? no, no. It's all, it's wouldn't that all be gone. nice imagine if they kept the track and just build houses yeah in like you, you, go, the Hoons. you go there now like you go down the northern road and you look across to a, what used to be where the track was and you you can't see like there's just thousands it. of houses but like dad and i actually did the very last track day at oran yeah. park in 2008 and we actually drove the last laps wow. of the circuit before the bulldozers actually no one sort of better came. really to, to do you've probably done the most like said anybody in history yeah i'd say your dad, well, dad, dad definitely and um yeah. so yeah for me i suppose I just kind of grew up around cars and driving. And as I said, from driving cars at a very young age and dad doing sort of motorsport over the years, it was just that sort of that natural progression of... So I, how, how old were you? Did you start in carts? And No, I didn't do I didn't do go-karting when I was a kid. Mum mm. and dad separated and sort of dad was off sort of doing business and uh, my sister and I were sort of with mum and, and did the usual sort of divorced parents sort of every second mm. weekend with dad. So... Whilst I never did go karting, I was still, as I said, from a young age driving cars. So I don't feel that I really missed out. Obviously, I would have loved to have done go karting, but I don't feel that I sort of really missed out on anything because I was still driving. So from a young age, did you? I mean, you see these young go karters and they want to, you know, they want to follow Danny Ricciardo, Mark Webber, footsteps, open wheel stuff. So you having that different sort of grounding early years, did you have those aspirations, or did you want to go tin tops? You know, like what was your early? I think for me, um, because I sort of grew up watching Peter Brock and Dick Johnson and going to Bathurst and doing all those sorts of cool things, um, I I suppose I sort of naturally gravitated more towards sort of touring cars Mm. than the open wheeler path. I've only ever done sort of three or four actual open wheel races in my life, sort of in Formula Ford, actually in New Zealand. So If, if you had to put a percentage on young drivers coming through, like I guess it may have changed over the years, but like. Yeah, I know. I remember watching too, like the long weekend in October, always watching Dickie Johnson and and Brocky and those guys, and glued to the TV, and, and would all, you know would have given anything to become a race car driver back then. But um, and, and I never even considered open wheel. But like young carters today, or kids coming through today, you know, if there was a percentage had to put on it, the guys that want to be Mark Webber or Danny Ricciardo or Lewis Hamilton. Or guys that actually start out going, oh, I want to be, you know, Courtney and Jamie Winkup and follow that that route. Do you, th- do you think they all start out? Do they all start out wanting to be open wheelers and then steer off when they don't make it, or do they actually th- start in different trajectories? I think it's actually changed over the over the years and over the generations. Like, sort of you go back to sort of obviously when we sort of grew up and everything like that. If you wanted to have a uh, a professional career as a race car driver, you had to go to Europe. Mm. Um, there was very few guys that made a living from racing touring cars here in Australia. Like you can literally just name them on one hand, like mm. your Peter Brock, your Dick Johnson, and it, like even Dick Johnson was the underdog. Like you think back to when he hit the rock, and it was sort yeah, of like yeah. that. There was because it was it, kind of like that family business almost, wasn't it? Back in the back in the eighties, and yeah, so the, when did it start to become a professional sport where you could make money and stay in Australia? Look, I think probably sometime towards sort of the late nineties. Like if you look at like Craig Lowndes was probably the first of the real sort of new generation mm. of young guys that came through that really sort of, I suppose, made that pathway that um, that young guys 
going into V8 supercars was actually a good idea because a lot of teams sort of back in those days, they sort of stuck with the established names and all that sort of stuff. Mm. And it wasn't really a, a platform for young guys to be able to sort of really grow uh, and really show their sort of skills. So that's why obviously a lot of guys tended to sort of head off towards Europe. But I think sort of the from sort of Craig Lounge sort of onwards, V8 supercars has now sort of become a, a genuine career path because there's so many more professional teams like we look at it today every team out there is professional there's, yeah. no, there's no more privateers there's no more sort of guys sort of, the, kind of yeah there's no guys sort of rocking up to Bathurst trying to sort of sort of pre-qualify and, and do all those sorts of things so mm. um, I think these days like kids coming through go-karting um, like I've done a bit of work with SP Tools with the Junior Sprockets program over the last sort of few years um, and these days kids look up to your, your Jamie Winkups your Scott McLaughlin's your Craig Lowndes and all that sort of stuff and they want to be those guys. They want to sort of go into V8 supercars and all mm. that sort of stuff. So there's still there's still very much a, a large portion of those kids that do want to go and follow the sort of open wheeler dream and go to Europe and do all those sorts of things. Mm. But I think probably in the last 20 years, the very much the shift has now sort of transitioned across to people want to stay here and want to make a, a career in V8 supercars because it's it's a genuine career path. Are we going to see another Aussie in F1 like in Danny Ricciardo around the 30 now? So yeah, look, it's a few more years there, but yeah, look, obviously Dan's doing a great job. It's been a, a tough year for him at Renault, but um, look, they've got some exciting things on the horizon and everything like that. Uh, of, of course, there will be someone that will follow sort of Dan Ricciardo. Who that will be, I, I don't There's really no know. One, no one in the. No, Jack yeah, well, well, Jack, yeah, 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 Jack, Jack, Jack Dewan's Dewan. Jack Dewan's doing some great things. He actually won in uh, in Asia on he's the weekend. Going and, pretty well, yeah, isn't he? yeah. Look, he's he's doing a great job, I suppose. Yeah, probably. Look, Jack Dewan is probably the. Wouldn't that be a cool the, thing to see? A, like a, a Dewan, like another you know another generation, like his, like yourself, like coming through with that that heritage. It'd be interesting to ask him why he went uh, you know went cart, carts instead of bikes. But well, he's no, his probably, dad's <laughs> the president of the. the he's, cart. He, he's seen his dad walk and doesn't want to sort of have that that's kind a of a good, limp. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, he's been through the wars. I'd, I'd probably go that way. Look, we got ahead of ourselves a bit there. Like, I still want to hear about your development as a race car driver. So, so you're Oran Park. You're in Sydney. Your, your your first experiences in race cars. I know before we sort of met. I was in 99, 8, 98, 99, I did production car stuff. I did a Bathurst with Tony Longhurst, and I, I think you were in that race in a yeah. production car category. Uh, yeah, I was in a Peugeot 306. I think that's about the last time I raced. <laughs> I think you, you sort of taken it, taken it a bit further, mate. Yeah, but I suppose like my the very first race I ever did actually wasn't even at Oran Park. It was actually at Eastern Creek. I did a um, it was a six hour relay race and actually shared a car with Dad in that. Um, and then how my, was that racing with your dad? That was, was that cool. cool. Yeah, yeah, look, I I think I I've been was very he giving you driving lessons all the time. Oh yeah, still you're still not, to doing this, a, not doing it right. Still to this day, he's uh, yeah, he's yeah. always giving you uh, free advice and everything. But um, look, a, a lot of second generation or even third generation races really sort of aspire to be able to sort of race with their dad at some point in time and i've been lucky enough i've i've done it a few times throughout my career and i I suppose i still look back as as them being real highlights to me because without dad i wouldn't be where i am yeah um and so to do that very first race and share a car with him was cool and we've done it a couple of times we've even raced against each other how good Uh, are dads though eh? like yeah to do something have a great dad like that and support you in that like i was the same with my dad you know got me into surf stuff and then he got me into we got into triathlon together and we did adventure racing together actually raced together in a team thing yeah. it is a, it's a great feeling so yeah so so you i saw your name come up a lot in the bathurst like from production car and then you started to get enduro drives so talk us through the progression because i know you know you've you've now a podium five times at bathurst in the bathurst 1000 which is you know the holy grail for people that aren't familiar with Bathurst it's the ultimate endurance you know would you call it the ultimate endurance race in Australian touring car oh ab- absolutely it's yeah. um and I think because there's so much history surrounding it and mm. and for me as I said I was I was that kid that grew up that watched Bathurst and like so many from the moment the telecast started in the morning until it finished in the afternoon just sat there glued to the TV and mm. even even today I sort of still consider myself so lucky because I look back at myself and think I still think back to that seven-year-old kid that sat there on the lounge, just glued watching the just TV. Just in awe of this. Yeah, I, I've, I can relate. Because, yeah, but then now you're the. Yeah, there's a seven-year-old kid watching you. Now. Yeah, like uh, does that keep you grounded? Oh, definitely. Like for me, it's just that. It's. I, I always still pinch myself every every time I get into a race car. I still mm. sort of pinch myself that I'm I'm living the dream of that kid that sat on the lounge wondering. But you've. I know you've worked hard. 
to get those opportunities. Oh yeah, yeah. Nothing. Look, nothing in any industry comes easy, in, especially in, at an elite sports level. As you know, everyone always looks at uh, what you've done and they go, "Oh yeah, you've been so lucky and everything like that." And th- there is a degree of luck along the way, but there's a huge amount of work and sacrifice and and stuff that goes on that people don't see mm-hmm. um, to get you there. So for me, like. My first Bathurst in the 1000 was 2002, but the lead up to that was sort of from when I first started racing was about eight years of doing all different sorts of one mate championships. I think I saw you driving Bathurst in like a Peugeot, like some Peugeot shit three o- <laughs> Peugeot 306. Yeah, I've, I've raced around 306. Ba- is probably named how long it takes to go yeah, around Bathurst. I've raced at Bathurst in a Magna. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, I mean, so you just take the drives and yeah, build your reputation. Yeah, as a young kid growing up, it was just any chance to drive a car. I was in there driving, racing, what, whatever it was. And I suppose I sort of got a bit of a reputation as doing a lot of different uh, one make championships and having success in those. Um, but I like suppose you've won the, the the old brute Ute yeah, series. Yeah, the Ute series. I won that two years in a row, and I think yeah. that was probably the real. That was the thing that sort of gave me the springboard into my first endurance race in the V8 supercars which was 2002 Lansvale Racing so Sydney based or the last Sydney based team um, to 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 race sort of V8 supercars mm. um, Trevor Ashby and Steve Reed. I'd known them for years yeah they're old names they, didn't they had they were running Group C Commodores and stuff back in the yeah, day. Yeah, sort, sort of. Sort of in, in the very early part of Group A's, and yeah, they yeah. They had an escort sports sedan prior to that. Um, yeah, question I had when I was, I was thinking about what I was going to ask you, like, what's changed because. In those eighties, nineties, I knew the names, and I mean, was I younger and had less things to do? You know, I watched it on TV, free to air. Today, I I don't watch as much supercars. You know, like I don't know whether it's because I know there's big names there, sure, but I don't know. Just sometimes I watch it and it just seems to all blend in, and it's too parody. I don't know if the old Group A days where you had an M3 up against the you know V8 or you know all that different stuff. It, yeah, Can look, you put it? Put your finger on it. Look, I've got a slide here. This this will actually Jace slide number two. Yep. Have a look at that. Yep. So slide number two, and Jace will bring that up on our vision. So for people that are watching or listening on iTunes or can't see the um, screen while they're driving and listening to this on YouTube, I've got a photo here of Dickie Johnson and and Brocky. And I think it's eighty four. Eighty four. Yep. Yeah? Yep. And then in the bottom, you'd be able to tell me better here, but that's um, does that be Courtney or one of no, that's obviously uh, that was at Sandown this year, so it'll be uh, that's Jamie in the car because it doesn't have the co-driver so light Jamie on. Co- oh, and yeah, yeah. judging by the helmet in the car behind, I think that's Caruso in there. So he partnered up with Cameron Waters this year in the, so in the Mustang. So we're looking at the Holden Commodore, the, yep. which is an Opal. We'll talk about that yep. later. <laughs> and the Mustang, uh, which doesn't look like much of a Mustang no, anymore. No, does it? Does it? it looks <laughs> no. more like that Mustang hybrid they've just bought out. Yeah, exactly. It? Maybe that's why they did it. And at the top, we've got the old Group C. Is that a Group C? Yeah, Group, group C. So that was the VK Commodore. Yeah, that big was flares. On that it. was the last year of Group C. So it was uh, 84, 85. They went to the Group A regulations, and I actually went to Bathurst that year. So they're strong memories for me. I was about fourteen. Yep. Yeah, me too. Like really like yeah. that era. Yeah. Is that bec- I don't know, the age that I was? Is that why I like those cars in that era? You know, is there yeah. a fourteen-year-old boy looking at the Mustang and the and the Opal VX, whatever that is? <laughs> um, with the same passion that we were looking at those cars. Yeah, look, at, at the one thing we're very fortunate with in our sport is the is the passion of our fans. Like mm, uh, the, these days, like you're still at Bathurst, Sandown, Gold Coast 600, or any of the supercar it's still rounds, there, but it? It, it's still there, especially mm. at Bathurst, because mm. again, it's that there's so much heritage there and everything like that, and there is a huge amount of passion from our fans. Like you've only got to you've only got to listen to obviously these days with social media, um, it gives people a platform to be able to sort of view their sort of. Uh, opinions. Yeah. Well, you Some, see with uh, Russell Engel's show, Enforcing the Do with yeah. Paul Morris, and they get a lot of comments, and it's great. It's good interaction with the fans. Yeah, and it's still there. Yeah, there's there's a huge amount of passion. Some people's passion, I think, sometimes is a little bit sort bit of over the top. a little bit over the top. Yeah. But again, no no sport is going to survive without passionate yeah. fans, and, yeah. and we've got some of them, the most passionate fans going around, and and yeah. it's great to you see the people that get Brocky tattoos. Is there who, who's who's most likely in in the current crop to have a tattoo? 
Oh, on, Craig, on a, on Craig, a, Craig Lounge. Craig Lounge, yeah, 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 yeah. There's right. um, like a, a few years ago, obviously, I, I did the, uh, I was with Craig for two years in, in the Enduros, and um, and there was a cup. I remember there was one time we were somewhere in Bathurst. Um, it was an autograph session. It wasn't the main one in town. We we're outside a shopping center or something. Yeah. Uh, and this woman came up and said, "Oh, Craig, like," and it was just like on on like her shoulder. Yeah. And like, oh, can you please sign this because I'm going to go straight to get the tattoo tattooed. parlor. Yeah. And get it tattooed. And like, we're sort of laughing and. The next day, she's come up to the track, came over Done. and saw him and, and showed him. So, what, what's, what's Lanzi think of that stuff? What, what is he? He look. He is the he's consummate what, professional, yeah. and he is the he's the people's champion, and yeah. he he really embraces the fans, and he, and he gives them the time, uh, and that's probably I suppose something that's kept his. It's important, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because again, without uh, I remember the best bit of advice I got early in my career was. It's not the day you get asked for your autograph that it's the problem. It's, it's the day, day you that you stop getting asked for your autograph <laughs> yeah. is a bigger problem. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And, and Craig is, and that's probably one of the best things I learned from Craig is you've got to give the fans the time. Like what? Um, oh, this is, might be a bit controversial, but I sort of picked up some stuff. Was it Fred Gibson's driver? Is it Stanaway? Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of autographs, I, know, I was just reading some comments. I mean, you can take them with a grain of salt, but it didn't sound like he was being a man of the people and yeah so it was with uh, Gary Rogers this year it was at uh, which round was it uh, one of the rounds I can't remember it was uh, I think it was the ones leading up to Indy oh and Indy I still call it Indy yeah every, I think Gold everyone, Coast, everyone yeah. still does yeah, Mr. Mr. an autograph session um, which maybe. was a uh, no I think it was after Townsville but it was uh, but yeah it was a it was a a team autograph session at their merchandise area, which he he missed, um, and so the penalty was that they stood him down for for the remainder so of that round. That wasn't just a one off, because surely that would. Be- yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. They never really sort of uh, mm. elaborated on uh, on what it was. I think it was actually Gold Coast, maybe. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it was Gold Coast. Um, so yeah, they they stood him down for discipline. So they take reasons. it serious, like you know, connecting, connecting with the fans. I remember in our Ironman days, we used to go out and do you know every hospital in town that we were racing at, every school, every shopping centre, and it really paid off mm. in the long run. It's different now, I guess, with social media, but still connecting face to face is probably a pretty important part of it. Oh, absolutely, and you, and you can't discount the fact that those that the fans and the people like they'll line up at those autograph sessions for an hour two mm. hours beforehand mm. waiting for for that sort of like 30 seconds of interaction with you whether it be just to sign a post to sign a hat get a photo with their kids or yeah. whatever it might be so you I guess you've got to think back to those you know, young boys watching these races and how impressionable they are exactly I remember a funny story I met I was sort of fan of all the drivers and and I knew Tony Longhurst was in te- was was at a I was at a local Gold Coast drags when they had the drag races there, and he had his Castrol Falcon there. And I think he was having a bad day. <laughs> and Tony's a really nice guy. I've gotten to know him quite well, but he can be a bit um, flighty. I don't know. He gets a lot on his plate. And uh, um, I've walked up to him and I said, "Oh, Tony, how you going, uh, Guy Andrews? I, I met you briefly at blah blah blah." And he sort of said, "Oh, like I'd remember that." <laughs> And I walked away, that first impression, going, what a wanker. You know? <laughs> and then his wife sort of, I saw his wife like spin him around like on the top, Karen, and, and going, it's a bloody guy, Andrews, you've met him, don't be a dickhead. You know, like, and he's come back, oh, sorry, guy, I remember, yeah, I remember. Anyway, so he, but like that's that, is, I guess you've got to remember too, and this is probably a big part of Guy's Garage, is like, you know, you've been successful, I've had, you know, a certain amount of success. I think of Mark Weber that I've met and these people, we're all just humans. We have bad yeah. days. Oh, exactly, you know, yeah. Um, you know, and everyone out there, and I see so many people sharing stories when we talk about different things that people are going through on the show here, and then I've had emails saying, oh, that's fantastic that you shared about that, and I've had this stress in my life. But, you know, like all these successful people that you, you see out there, and we used to watch on the screen when we were seven, like they, they have a life too. They've got a... Oh, they're no different to everybody else. So yeah, I guess there's a, a part of that. Yeah, yeah, oh, definitely. But you, and again, you can't sort of. You, you got to remember that, even though like you might be having a stressful day, like for us at the track, like you've got dramas with the car, whatever it might be. The moment you walk out the back of the garage to to walk over to the truck, there's the fans out there. They so don't, still a part of your Yeah, job. they they don't know what's going on, and they don't. They're not privy to the stresses and dramas and everything like that. They. They've been standing out in the heat for, as I said, for however long. They just want that one photo, whatever yeah. it might be, yeah. um, and that's what's important and urgent to them. 
what's important and urgent to you is to get back to the truck to get change because you're hot or whatever. Mm. Um, but yeah, you can't. You can't you be can't Kimmy just, Rockin no, and, and no, you speak. can't just push your way past <laughs> and sort of like push them to the side because yeah. they're the people that support. At the end of the day, they're paying your bills because exactly, they're not, they're yeah. not buying your product the, or whatever you're selling. It's yeah, they don't turn up. We don't have a job. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly, mate. I got um another slide here. Slide number uh, Jace uh, number one. Let's have a look at that, mate. That's your uh, championship winning Porsche. Unfortunately, it wasn't the championship winning. That's car. not it. We, well, no, we finished second that year. Oh. Yeah. I've done my research well. Yeah. <laughs> we so that's nearly the best Porsche. Nearly the best Porsche. But, um, so that's a parody. That's a one-mate series. Yep. Most successful one-mate series in the world. In the world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And is it who was the guy that went on recently in the last couple of years and went on raced overseas? So um, through the team Porsche. that I've raced for, sort of, um, I've done three seasons in Carrera Cup now. Obviously, just finished um, doing Carrera Cup this year, albeit missed out on the last two rounds because of sponsorship dramas. Yep. But so McElroy Racing, who are based up here in Queensland, based out at Yatla, Andy McElroy, ex-racer himself. Um, so we've had a couple of really good young guys come through. So Matt Campbell came through That's the one, sort yeah. of in 2016, went on to, to go to Europe. He's now a proper, uh, for 2020, is a full uh, factory pro driver for yeah, Porsche. Right. So he's been a Porsche junior for the last sort of few That's years. amazing, isn't it? Um, so he's really lived the dream. So Porsche have really set up a um, what they call sort of the, the Porsche pyramid. So you've got the Porsche GT3 Challenge, which is the older spec um, Carrera Cup car. Right. Then you've got from that you graduate up and do Carrera Cup here in Australia. And then you've got Super Cup, which is the, the Porsche... Porsche Cup Championship that goes to all the Formula One races. Oh, uh, yeah. Yep. Um, so, Maddie did the Super Cup in 2017. So, yeah, he won the championship here, 16, 17, uh, doing Super Cup, finished third in the championship, had a couple of wins, few pole positions, wow. and really sort of um, made people at Porsche sort of take notice. Yeah. And has then been a, a Porsche factory junior driver for the last three years. Uh, he's won at Le Mans 24 hour, yeah. uh, won Bathurst 12 hour this year. Um, so he he's a he's a real talent, and and Porsche have got some big plans for him. And then Jackson Evans um, won the Carrera Cup championship here last year, went on to do Super Cup this year, and is going back again with Porsche backing to go do Carrera, uh, Super Cup again next year. So, so tell me, you like to run? You're talking about sponsorship for this car to run it. So what what's it cost to run a GT3 Porsche in a round in uh, Australia? For the championship, you're looking at around about four hundred thousand dollars for the year. For the year, depending on damage. Yeah, now that's that obviously can, not including the car. What's the car worth? Uh, relatively speaking, in motorsport terms, they're not too bad. They're just over the three hundred thousand mark. Right. Uh, when you consider what a Porsche road car is worth, they're actually cheaper than the than the road car. Like your road cars are up sort of around the sort of four hundred thousand and right. beyond mark. And what is so, it? What's the spec in this car, engine wise? And so they run the three point six liter, naturally aspirated. Uh, putting out around about sort of 380 horsepower, six-speed paddle shift gearbox. Mm. Um, it bears, the only thing that it bears resemblance to the road car is the overall shape. Yeah. Pretty much all from when the when the basic body shell goes down the production line, it comes off and goes to the race factory and it's built as a race car. So fully welded in roll cage, everything is done at the race factory. It's not a converted road car. It's uh, it's built as a race car. And, and, and these things around Bathurst, like they, their times can compared to a V8 supercar these days. Not, not About a second and a half off what a V8 supercar is. So only just a bit slower. Only a little bit slower, yeah. and most of that's in straight line speed because obviously you're talking 400 horsepower versus yep. 650 horsepower. Yep. These, are, these are lighter, better tyres, but don't have quite as much aero as the supercar. Yep. But the handling of these is actually, they're what better you, than the what are you? What are the main differences between driving that and a supercar? Well, one's left-hand drive and one's right-hand well, drive. Good, yeah. <laughs> well, is that better for Bathurst, left-hand? Uh, turning it, left a lot, aren't you? Yeah, you are yeah. turning more left. Um, it doesn't really bother me. Like, I've sort of like... So that year, so 2013, 2014, when I did Carrera Cup, and I was doing Bathurst, so I had the Cup car and obviously the V8 supercar. So you'd literally jump out of one, so right-hand drive, six-speed sequential gearbox yeah, into left-hand drive, paddle shift. paddle shift and everything like that. So for me, I've always sort of jumped between different cars, so I don't see it as a real big yeah. sort of drama to sort of jump between them. But um, but that year in particular, that was a that was a pretty stressful year because um, we had a had a crash in practice in the Porsche, which did a lot of damage, and the boys worked a, all night to sort of get the car back together. Then in Saturday practice in the V8 supercars, I had the brake failure at turn two, had the uh, big crash 
which uh, took myself and Craig Lowndes out. So uh, can I, I just just before we're going to watch that video actually? Yeah, um, I've worked with you at Movie World, and I was thinking about this before. <laughs> I crashed that many times working at Movie World, but I wasn't the only one. But the only one that didn't ever crash was you. Yeah. So you make up for it in a big way here, but this isn't your, this is mechanical, huh? Yeah, two, 262 k's an hour, went for the pedal and it went straight to the floor. So talk us through this. We'll watch the video. So, so watch the video first. I threw the thing sideways, hit Craig, backwards in and, uh, yeah. Yeah, right. It, uh, it all happened pretty quick, let me tell you. So Craig... You've done the Enduros with Craig. Are you in the same team? No, so this was the first year. So Craig and I were together in 2013, uh, 2012, 2013. This is 2014. And did he dump you for the Enduros? <laughs> is this, this is the Enduro. So, no, you, this is, so this is the year after. So I'd, I'd left, gone to HRT. So you just thought you'd crash into your old teammate. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me, you're going up Mountain Straight, 260k an hour. That's good. You're giving you a bit of a hug. Yeah, we've been good mates for a long time. Yeah. And uh, look... So he obviously knows something's not right because yeah. you're not the kind of driver that's going to no. run in the back so, of it. Um, so I'd, been, I'd already been out, done a bunch of laps. We'd come in, we'd sort of made a couple of changes on the car and uh, I'd actually left the pits and the guys actually came on the radio and just sort of, um, as I was leaving the pits to sort of come out onto the track, the engineer was like, look, uh, CL's just coming through turn one, let him go, you've got clear track behind him. So... Touch wood, thankfully, I actually didn't accelerate as hard as probably what I could have coming out of yeah, the pits because I through. saw Craig go yeah. and then I sort of slowly sort of got up to speed. As I've gone up Mountain Straight, there was a problem with the front left brake fitting uh, where it goes into the back of the caliper and it actually fractured. Right. So when I've when they've pushed me out of the garage with light pressure on the on the brakes, it was fine. So mm. going up pit lane, I'd sort of I'd done the usual, just tap the yep. tap the brake, there was pedal pressure there. As I've come out onto the track, gone up the straight, when I've hit the brakes and then you've then got hard pressure, maximum sort of um, pressure going through the line, it's actually popped the line off the back of the, off the, off the, where it goes into the caliper. Yeah. So basically no front brakes. So is that why the rear went stepped out? Yeah. So, so it's, uh, it's, it, it, it locked the, the it locked the rears yeah. and in my panic, because obviously the pedal's gone straight to the yeah. floor because it's just pumping fluid out. Yeah. I managed to get it down a couple of gears, which helped to throw the thing sideways. Yeah. And luckily for me, unlucky for Craig, hitting him is what actually rotated it and sent us into the wall backwards. Because yeah. if I had have gone in forwards, right it would have been a much bigger impact for me. Yeah. As it, and as destroyed it, the car completely. Well, it still destroyed the car. Was it done? <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that yeah. We, we didn't even end up racing because it right. did too much damage to the cage. Um, but it's also a testament to the to the build strength and that of the cars yeah. that, uh, that I walked away and yeah. literally... An hour and a half after that, I was back in the Porsche doing qualifying. Yeah, right. And how, how, how do you cope with that mentally? Like, you go from a big crash like that, do you think about like something going wrong when you get back in the other car? Well, it was interesting because after I'd uh, had that happen, I had to go to the medical center and get sort of clearance. And my first priority was to make sure that the Porsche guys knew that I was okay. And I'm like, look, yeah, I've yeah. got to go to the medical center. Yeah. I've got to get the clearance. So the, the doctors do all the necessary checks so and I can that drive again. to make yeah. sure. But obviously I wanted to let those guys know, like, I'll be there. I'll, I'll yeah. be there soon. Yeah. Um, and for me, I suppose the, the mental thing was at least – because it was a mechanical failing and not my failing, I could sort of... You I, it, yeah. Yeah, I was like, look, unfortunately, sometimes things go wrong, but it was a mechanical failing. It wasn't a mistake of mine. Is uh, that better or worse? Because, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm sure you're going to lose your nerve if you if you lose your skill and crash, but then you're then thinking about, okay, what's the next mechanical thing that's going to go wrong? Look, it's one of those things you have to, you have to accept in our game that, unfortunately, sometimes things do go wrong, whether it be as a mechanical situation like in that mm. or as a driver. I've made plenty of mistakes over the years. Mm. Um, things, unfortunately, are going to sometimes happen. Um, one of the questions I had for you was like, you know, in the safety is amazing, but, you know, we've had deaths in motorsport yep. and, 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 I, and Formula One drivers, like, I don't know, do you think at some point they go, hey, I've, I've had enough of risk of my life you know like is it is it different in in your game or is it the same thing can you lose that edge um yeah look i suppose if you if you dwell on the negatives um yeah there's there's an inherent risk with it uh, like you said with formula one obviously the speeds that they're going and everything is that like that ris- is that riskier formula yeah, one or? um i think look i think when you when you take into consideration the huge efforts that they've made over the years like you you go back go back to the 60s and 70s it was commonplace. Like you knew yeah. that at the start of the season, Someone's you look at, you look at the grid at the start of the season versus who's going to still be yeah. there at the end. Yeah. You were going to lose three or four people as the season went on, and that was just 
It's a that whole was, other world. That yeah. was just normal. That, yeah. that wasn't something that was just like, oh, my God. Like, this was yeah. just yeah. – it was – you you read any of the biographies of those guys back then, it was like f- going to funerals for your friends that got killed in racing was was almost like a monthly occurrence yeah. because there was just – there wasn't the safety in the cars or the tracks. Yeah. Um, in Formula One terms, the last fatality was Jules Bianchi, yeah. where there was that horrific accident. That was where a he, random event. Yeah, wasn't it, it was. It was very. It was very random, but mm. it also brought up safety things, which is why they've now got the halo. Yeah. There's things from the circuits' perspective about obviously you can't have um, vehicles like that on track to, uh, recovering, and mm. th- there's a, you, you never stop learning as as a sport. There's always things we can do. Unfortunately death is one of those things that will mm. from time to time happen but the more we can improve it yeah the less the chances are so are you having a young family and you know you're in a somewhat risky sport like i asked this my last guest john said he you know he's a he's a sas former sas soldier like how do you compartmentalize you know what you've got to do at work and then coming home and being a dad or you know like I was sort of trying to tie it back to blokes that have got everyday stresses at work and things they've got to do and how they deal with it. Yeah, a lot of people have asked, like, since obviously we had our daughter Ivy, like, does it does it make you go slower because you're thinking more about your family? I think it's probably more the other way because you want. And you, you say, "Where well, do you, you think I'm going slower?" Yeah, no, but you need job security. It's like I've got a family. I've got to pay. I've got to, got to provide. I, I, <laughs> I need to keep my job. I, I yeah, can't yeah. afford to go any slower. Um, look, for me, it's 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 not something I think about when I'm in the car. Obviously, yeah. I love my family and and everything like that. Um, and yes, there there is an inherent risk in, in what I do. It's foolish to say that there's not. Um, you still love but, it? Yeah, ab- absolutely. It's just yeah. I love I love driving cars. Do you know any be- professional race car driver that doesn't love racing a car? Um, That's still good at it. No, I think every, everyone has that sort of you got to have passion for what you do because if you don't have a passion for what you do, especially at an elite level in anything, whether it be in sport, in music, in in whatever, you mm-hmm. it, the, when you lose your passion for what you do, that's when you Feels don't like work. you don't perform yeah. to your absolute maximum. Yeah. Um, and in our game, that's when you obviously it's time to step away at that point. Tell me your highlight. Like I know we said before, you've podium five times at Bathurst now is there a highlight in there not out of those five out of everything driving highlight um look I'd have to I'd have to say the first Bathurst podium 2012 with Craig Lowndes like to step out onto a podium with with anyone yeah is is going to be huge but to do it with Craig Lowndes like the 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 fan favorite was that the 50 year anniversary uh, I did read that somewhere one of them was I think 2013 might have been the 50 year. I'm not. I can't remember. But again, for me, it was that. Think back to the seven year old kid that used to sit there and watching and yeah. look at the guys get on yeah. the podium at yeah. the end of the day and and he, that he to, to then walk out onto that podium and the sea of people just chanting your name just a and, surreal and just oh, it was just it's something that just gives you goosebumps. How do you pick yourself up after some uh, you know a massive high like that? Um, for me, I like. Don't get me wrong. I, I I love those moments because it's it's the it's the reward for a job well done. Um, but for me, it's a case of like you wake up the next morning. It's like okay, I need to get home and get back to work, get back to life, and everything like that. It's not like I don't sort of walk around for two weeks patting myself on the back or anything like that. Especially now with a family. Yeah, it's just like you do do a lot of jobs, don't you? Like you've got <laughs> the, the stunt job. Um, yep. You do a lot of motoring journalist stuff. Tell us a bit about how you fit all that together. Uh if, Sometimes it's a bit of a it's a bit of a it's a bit frantic at times. So yeah, I've been with Motor Magazine for fifteen years now. So I do a lot of the a lot of the annual performance car stuff. So performance car of the year, bang for your bucks, our annual tire test, uh, and a lot of other sort of smaller bits and pieces sort of throughout the year. So for me, that came about um, basically from my love of cars and driving. And uh, a couple of mates of mine were working at the magazine in, so 2004 was when I first started. Um, they needed someone to help out with performance car of the year that year. They gave me a call and I'm like, sure, come to a track and drive a whole bunch of different cool cars. <laughs> Sounds like perfect work for me. Yeah, and, yeah. and I've been there ever since. Yeah, so, right. uh, and still for me, even like some of the stuff that I do with Motor Magazine is some of the, some of the coolest and fun, most fun stuff I've done in my career because it's, for me, like going to a track and driving a car, it doesn't bother me whether, like with Motor Magazine, it's just half a dozen of us there and 20 of the coolest cars and there's not one single person there watching or you're at a V8 supercar round and there's 
tens of, of pressure, thousands of people. Pressure so, environment. Yeah, well, it doesn't, like, you, don't, you don't see it as any well, different. You're no, just driving just, a car. It's, for me, it's it's yeah. driving a car and it's getting back to the Basics. that love of just going out there and, do, and doing what you do. Yeah. Clearly, from a commercial standpoint, it's better for the V8 supercar rounds and motorsport that there is tens of thousands yeah, of people yeah, there yeah, watching. Nobody, it's sort of yeah. us going around in a in a paddock on bitumen when yeah. there's no one there. Can tell us a bit about the stunt driving. So yeah, I've been at Movie World now since 2008. Obviously, you and I both started there in 2008. You know, when we auditioned, I went into the auditioning the audition at uh, Holden Driver Training Centre, and I had no idea what I was in for. <laughs> Me and, neither. And here's Warren Luff. <laughs> Warren Luff's in my audition. All those ten guys and all these guys that just look like you know stunt drivers and drifters and that. And I'm like, I was well, like feeling like I was out of my league, you know. <laughs> so that wasn't, you know. Tell us your perspective of that. It was, um, yeah, like movie world's become a huge part of my life. Like I've been there for just on 11 years now. But it was interesting for me how that all came about because when they were when they advertised for the show that we obviously started in. I was standing at Brizzy Airport about to get on a plane to go to Germany for three weeks to go do Nürburgring 24 hour and a bit of a bit of a trip over there. And a mate of mine rang me and said, hey, have you heard that Movie World are auditioning for some new driving show? And I'm like, haven't heard anything about it. And literally, like I was on like an afternoon flight and the applications closed that day. Yeah. And so I basically sent them an email from the airport like, hey, like, just, heard, <laughs> just <laughs> heard... One line of, of text. Heard about this. Um don't have any video I can send because I'm literally at the airport about to get on a plane. But I go all right. <laughs> I've kind of driven a few cars and yeah. got the call up to come to the auditions. And as you know, we did the first one out at the How out at Morris's place yeah. and uh, doing all sorts of crazy stuff. And then we did the second one out at um, Queensland yeah, Raceway, Raceway at the, yeah. at the dragway out there. And then yeah. you and I were part of the original 12. I know. That was, it was 12 great. Or ten, 12 or 10 of us, I think. I think it was only 10. 10. Yeah. Yeah, 10 of us. And the first day they got there, gave us a Commodore each and said, all oh, right. And they progressively got harder, didn't they? They said, "I oh, do a threshold stop, do a J, do a one eight, do a like a ninety stop, do a ninety stop, yeah. one eighty, a J turn. What's a J turn? Okay, yeah. And then forward three sixties. Remember that? Yep. Oh, anyone want to try a reverse three sixty? Hell yeah! Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was uh, that was our audition process. That yeah, was a bit fun, wasn't it? No, it was cool. And and then obviously we did the two wheeling, and like mm. for me. Um, and same as any of the guys in that show, even a lot of the stunt guys that have done a lot of a lot of movie work and that. I think for all of us, the the driving on two wheels yeah. is probably that was something the, new. Huh? For, even for me, still to this day, I I tell people like yeah. learning to drive on two wheels is the hardest thing I've ever done yeah. because it's just it so goes against it everything does. you've ever sort well, of taught yourself. After doing it for a couple of years, and you know we we're, we're getting we we're the best probably in the country or the world that we did so much of it. Yeah. But I went. I went and did a one-off um, mini cup drive in WA. Yep. And that you know when you come down the hill and you turn onto the front straight, and I was just smashing that ripple strip, and the thing was just standing up on two wheels, and <laughs> I was just riding it up real high, and I was on. I was highest driver up. So obviously when we two wheel, people that don't know, you're too, generally two wheel low side down yep. for the weight down low, but um. Well, I'll drive her up, so you obviously got eighty kilos of weight up there, so the thing's never going to roll over. But people were going, "Holy shit, you're getting that thing up high! I think you're going to roll it." And I'm like, "Nah, nowhere near trust, it." Trust me, that's a that's a long way off. Nowhere near it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I miss that stuff. I, I um, I've started getting back into a little bit of just local motor car, mucking yep. around, build a little shitty car, and um, I actually want to build a two wheel car. Just get that because it's been quite a few years since I've two wheeled, so I need to get the um the skills back up. Yeah, well, I haven't two wheeled since we finished the show in two thousand early two thousand and fourteen. Oh, right. It's not in the show anymore. No, is it? Yeah, so, so I think we should make a day. Let's make a video. Yeah, let's do it. So I'm going to make a video with Luffy. You're going to go out and refresh our uh, our two wheeling skills. So we'll get that sorted. I, I reckon he. I reckon here's the plan. Yeah. You talk about mental health and everything like that. Yeah. The and you're not allowed to cheat with this All right so once you've built the car and the ramp I'll come out the very first day yes and each each attempt we put ten dollars down All right <laughs> and we'll keep and so we'll We'll do like a, a bit of a pattern. It's not just who can be the two first wheel. one to get yeah, it up. Yeah, yeah, you've got like to go you've, through you've, like you've a got to sort of get, You've got to get it up onto two wheels and figure drive eight. it. Yeah, figure eights. Yeah. So we'll keep chipping in $10 so that until the first person that does it yeah. and does the course and whatever the amount's whatever in the, the kitty, amount whatever the amount's in the kitty, we'll give that to ca- charity. We'll give to some mental right. health charity. We'll give it to, um, we'll actually, we'll split it. We'll, we'll go, let's go mental health and prostate. So prostate, I, I support, um, it's a bloke thing. Yep. 
they're a great charity uh, for raising awareness and funds for research into prostate. Yep. So we'll do prostate and we'll look for we'll get a mental health one yep. as well. Uh, that's that's a deal. Yeah, right? that's a deal. Cool. We'll make the rules up. We'll make a video of it, mate. While we're having well, we're having a bit of a laugh, look, I, I took the liberty. This is going to be a little bit of a challenge for us because if you're watching on YouTube, you'll be able to get right into this. If you're listening on iTunes, you're going to have to go onto social media or later on and have a look. But what I did, Luffy, is yesterday I put a post up. I saw that. Yeah, and I asked people to nominate the ugliest car in our generation. So for you and I, so since 1970. Yep. The ugliest Australian delivered car. Uh, so I've got about 10 or 12 cars and on a slide here. So... The first one that was nominated. Now, this is not in any necessary. We're going to pick an order, so I want you to help me. Yep. Pick a grid top ten of a the ugly car grid. All right. It's the guy's garage ugliest car grid in Australia. So the first nomination, Jace, if you can pull that up. Slide number three. Remember the old Leyland P seventy six. P seventy six. A car that came into the Australian market with huge. Ex- it got wheels car of the year. It had a four point four liter V eight in it. Yeah, like the engine was it. Yeah. The engine was good. Yeah. Um, allegedly, it was actually not a bad car to drive. You fit a forty-four gallon drum in the boot. I saw <laughs> that when I was. Uh, it did have a big butt on it. Yeah. It was like a Beyonce. But um, that was in. They reckon P seventy six stood for uh, Project nineteen seventy six. But the funny thing was, I think it was built between seventy one and seventy three. So yeah, there you go. not sure what happened there. They probably expected it to last a bit longer than that. They made a coupe version. Slide four. Yeah, you thought the P seventy six was ugly. Yeah, the this coupe. is the P seventy six coupe. It's called the Force Seven V. That's a, that's a, a little bit uglier, isn't it? Yeah, that, that is like the um, that's like an inbred, like a a pony, like a small, like one of them small Shetland ponies has made out with a Mustang. Yeah, it's hey, um, it kind of re- it reminds me a bit of a like a. I've never seen one. No, but that's apparently. Look at the rake on that front windscreen. Yeah, there's there's a reason why you haven't seen many yeah, of them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's the four. I like the names back then in the seventies. Yeah. Four seven V, slide five. Now this thing, this is a Sanyon Stavic. It looks like a rodent. It looks like the Pope's meant to be in the back of it. Yeah, I reckon they've gone. <laughs> the Pope's popular. Look at all everyone yeah. cheering. It's, and the, let's make something it looks like a Pope mobile. But like, it's got little Bugs Bunny like rodent teeth at the front. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's it. That's Sa- a, anything Sangyong. Yeah, and the, and the thing was like because the Sangyong basically used a lot of Mercedes running gear. Yeah, right. So it was Mercedes engines and everything like that. So they got a full they got a full drive. Yeah, they yeah the they dual had cab a, thing. But yeah, it's real ugly too. Yeah, it was it was horrendous. We'll have to do the the, the dual cab Ute ugliness award. Yeah, hey, what about it. this one? I remember this one. Slide six, the Mitsubishi Nimbus. It's got a <laughs> space wagon. That must be a. Is that left hand drive? That's yeah. not Australian. But, but it's interesting when you look at... That's the Nimbus from Australia. Yeah, it has got a go. Yeah. yeah. But you That's look, actually their kid. But look at how much cars have grown. Like, I remember a mate of mine... That's his a space mum, wagon. His mum had one of those. Yeah. And, and it was a pretty spacious sort of car and everything. Again, ugly as. It's not that big, is it? No. Like, you look at... Well, have you ever driven behind the old Jeep? Is it the Jeep Wrangler? Yeah. The four... It's tiny. Yeah. Yeah. And a shitbox. Yep. Hey, this was a bit controversial. It came up on the nomination. This is very controversial. The walking short Commodore. So now, now listen, humans, I notice, are very good at judging people by their looks, right? Yep. Now, when it comes to cars, though, I noticed on some of the comments, I can't look at that car and judge it on its looks purely alone because I know it's, you know, it was a Group A Commodore. It's probably, it won't win Bathurst. I mean, it was a uh, ripping car. It come along in that Group A period of V8s. Yeah. And I liked the thing as a race car. Yep. But to look at it in isolation and purely on its looks, that's a bloody ugly kit, really. you got to remember. It's functional. Yeah. you got to remember, though, at the time, there was so much more going on because it was it was at the point when the relationship between Holden and Peter Brock Broke all fell out. over. Yeah. And then Tom Walkinshaw came into yes. Australia and set up HSV. So that was the first car produced from HSV. So that was a car that was designed in the wind tunnel and everything like that. So, so we're saying the Pommies had just got no well, taste. It, well, it, it polarised opinion here because there was your, your Holden people that were so staunchly loyal to Peter Brock yeah, um, and they felt that obviously that the, the relationship breaking down with Holden was on the fault of so Holden every, and not on Brock. all those fans are going to hate anything that comes out. Yeah, exactly. Out like you, it doesn't matter what they were going to bring out. 
the thing is though today those cars yeah. in value worth. are worth huge dollars yeah, yeah. and people now sort of like really hold them dear as as the Australian muscle car so yeah. that was that was the first they do look better with big wheels I mean that was a big wheel back then wasn't it 16 inch yeah. wheel or something it's probably not even but um yeah, but in isolation, I, I can see their point, but it wouldn't win my ugliest car. It's going to be no. on the back of the grid. But in, in response to that, we had slide eight, which is the mighty AU Falcon. Yeah, now that was ugly. Yeah, well, see, I look at that and because I, you know... You, I've had, to, you had an AU Falcon, uh, didn't I didn't you? I an AU. No, I've, no. Well, I've got a BF now. And I've oh, had you, a no, you had of, your BF. No, you but had, I'm, and, it's funny how it goes, though. So I grew up a Holden Commodore guy, loved Brocky. You know, when I was a young teenager, and then when I got a bit of money, I went straight down to the Holden dealership and said, "I want the latest." It wasn't I couldn't get a Holden dealer team car, or just I, um, I, don't, I don't even know HSV might have been just started. Yeah, it was around the a, the VN sort of thing, and um, I, I went, "I'll get an SS Commodore." Couldn't get one. Couldn't get a test drive mm. for love nor money, and I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, I'll go over to Ford," and I ended up with an an XR8 manual EB Falcon. It's funny because I took a Telstar t- yeah. t- or a laser no laser laser TX3 laser TX3 yep. turbo four wheel drive back in those days everything was real pitchy understeery you know boosty yep horrible hated it drove it around back streets got in the XR8 with the torquey V8 and these days standards not that powerful really but it had torque and lit it up everywhere and I went I'll take it <laughs> you know and I, <laughs> I drove it back to the Gold Coast from Sydney but so from that day on I've just sort of ended up buying Fords yeah and that was just purely by chance that I couldn't get into a, a Holden. But all the young drift guys are buying these AU Falcons now because they've got the live axle rear end, an unbreakable six cylinder, and even the, they're even running them in the old, just the autos. Yeah. And they're flogging the hell out of them and they just keep on giving it. So they're just passing these things around like bargaining chips for 1500 bucks. But so I look at that, same thing. I look at that and I don't see an ugly car. I see something that's a little bit practical, gets kids into, you know, a bit of motorsport. The at a low level, but it is ugly. The sales figures at the time definitely show that it was an ugly car. Yes, <laughs> right. So it's on the on the <laughs> next one. So we should describe these cars to people listening. So the next one's the PT Cruiser. Remember the Chrysler PT Cruiser? I think I said you before. My dad wanted to buy one of these at once. Your set. dad was a car guy. That's oh, I know. Did he admit that he, out loud? Yeah. Look, he is. He's definitely had some sort of um, strange choices yeah. in life. Maybe he's an with old cars swinger. as well. You don't even know about it. <laughs> that that I could see what they're trying to do there. Because they had the other roadster thing as well. Yeah, so that they was were at, trying. That was at a time when sort of uh, Chrysler was sort of going the whole retro look. Mm, like you said, they had clearly. that they had that roadster that yeah, was a that I was think a cool got a photo thing. Of one of them in there. And so they were like, "Oh, cool, we're winning on this whole retro look. Let's, let's keep going. Let's try it." And but it was then, a dog as well, wasn't it? Yeah, but we're no. just going purely on looks. Yeah, no, that's I nicknamed ugly. it the the Pity Cruiser. Yep. All right, we've got a Volvo. That's a that's a Volvo like a state. But remember, this is the same thing as the Walkinshaw. Like they had the 850 wagon that they raced in British touring cars. Yep. So I, I look at that and go, oh, well, I remember that flying brick, do they call it? Yeah. And then even here in Australia, like you had John Bow drive one in the mm. touring car championship in the mid 80s. Actually, yeah. it actually won the Australian touring car championship Did in it? 80 with Robbie Francovic. Yeah, right. See, so, that's a crazy, like they're a heavy old thing, but they're, they're actually built pretty well didn't they say boxy but good wasn't that the yeah, slogan well, their, their whole sort of thing during that sort of like 80s and that was that it was all built around safety yes. and they, they yeah. were regarded as the safest cars yeah. at the time so there was a lot of inbuilt safety um, that sort of built their reputation but we're looks, again we're just looking on looks yeah but yeah. looks looks was never going to be at strong point nah, nah they always had massive bumper bars didn't they yeah and old drivers alright and the VN Commodore got a, got a yeah, how nomination that, how did that get a nomination is that my nomination no okay Pretty handy car in its day, really. Yeah, like it was... Um, we yeah. battered the shit out of one of these at stunt training for That's Mad right. Max and that we bent the panard rod in the rear so we are going yeah. sideways in the dirt and that. But they do stand up to a bit. Well, that was our that was our original two-wheel car, remember, that we all It was. On. Yeah. It was. We two-wheeled that one of those forever. Yeah. And and um, the thing with that in that 90s, that period, same with the AU, they're just very bland. Yeah, but they? again, you look at cars of that era um, and it was... It, that's, I suppose, by modern standards, we look back and go, "Oh, they were all very bland." Mm, mm. Uh, but at the time, like, yeah. it's not the ugliest one. No, though. definitely not. Yeah. Oh, yeah. this one's interesting. The next one. So that is a Citroen. What do they call that? A D special wagon. Yeah. And actually, the sedan's uglier. 
The sand looks more like a cockroach. Yeah. But that's like from the early 60s or 70s. Uh, it is. Write down the age of it. Someone will tell us on yeah. social media. I think it's, yeah, it could be 60s or early 70s. Yeah, but like the... But that had pneumatic suspension and yeah, everything. Pneumatic, like, then, didn't it? They were so far ahead of their time. Mm. And in terms of value today, like, yes, okay... I agree. It's ugly. Yeah. It's, it's certainly not a pretty car. But they've actually had like a bit of a resurgence. Like yeah. there's a... Well, I Googled one of these. and This was actually in our car park at my surf club. Yeah. It's in good nick. But I Googled one. first one that come up was at um, auction for 33 grand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and they go for a lot more than that. What about reliability? I look at those things and I just think maybe... Look, it's French. Yes. French have never been well, known for great reliability. I spent 12 months fixing my Renault Clio myself. But that's partly because I was slow. But yeah. yeah, I know what you're saying. Imagine the parts. Imagine buying a pneumatic suspension oh. pump or something for that. <laughs> That'd be thirty-three grand on yeah. its own. But so look, at the, got, look at the front bumpers on that. Like, imagine yeah. trying to repair that. You don't get them. And what about that, that lens cover? You wouldn't be able to find one of them. Or the yeah. bonnet. Yeah. Well, actually, the bonnet would make a good ski. Um, to yeah. Modern if you turned it upside down. Let's flick through. I haven't got any more uh, numbers with me, Jace. But let's flick yeah, through. Is that it? There might be a couple more. Oh, yeah. This got us. Got it. The Tribeca. The Subaru, they really went away from there. That's a Subaru. Yeah. Like I don't find it. I didn't. Th- I was surprised when I saw that nomination. But I had a couple of people. Maybe it's the f- when when people look at the grill and that as a face. Yeah. And then you start going, yeah, that's an ugly. Face. Yeah. If, if you look at just the grill and the headlights and everything like that, it's not. Yeah, I didn't but, think it was. But too in bad. that sort of in that sort of medium SUV market and all that sort of stuff, there's uh, not a lot of good. There, there's not a lot that separates them. It's pretty much all down to sort of everything forward of the of the headlights yeah but one i actually said to you earlier and i don't think we've got a picture of it have a look oh, at the new yes. rolls royce four wheel drive that has got to be the what ugliest would you say it's like the, way, the car that that homer, homer simpson, simpson de- designed yeah the, the thing that homer simpson designed is gonna google it for yeah us. it is the ugliest looking thing you've ever seen I'm spreading these out with a ridiculous price tag to go with it spreading all these photos out of the car so we can pick out top 10 yeah it looks a bit like <laughs> Yeah, yep. sort of a roller skate kind of. It sort of takes the the seventies Volvo styling and put a Rolls Royce grill on it. Mm. A lot of those rollers, like you see, you know, and you see the Asians get some thing and they stick a roller grill on the front of it. Yeah, like the Rolls Royce itself doesn't look much. Yeah, but the thing is, if you take that car, take the Rolls Royce badge off it and put a Kia logo on it or a Sangyong if you, mm. you put a Sangyong badge on that you couldn't give them away they'd be nominated straight away yeah exactly yeah. but again you put a you put a Rolls Royce badge on it has it got a bitchin motor in it oh be V12 yeah be, so that's the know, thing some, something ridiculous I think they're like five, six hundred grand oh, or something I think if I was going to buy a, a, a SUV and I had unlimited money I'd buy your ass <laughs> <laughs> the Lamborghini. Oh yeah, the Lamborghini your ass. Yes. I'd like to get into that your ass. <laughs> hey, um we gotta get back onto our nominations. Yep. So let's pick a top ten. So we've nearly been talking an hour, mate, so let's wrap, we'll yep. wrap this up with this top ten. So what's your number one on <sighs> Look, I think the we'll take, actually, we'll take the we'll take the Force Nine X out. We'll just leave the P seventy yep. six in. There's one also that isn't in there that I think definitely deserves a mention and mm. that's the Ford Taurus. Oh, I got one in here. Yeah, Jace, jump on those slides again. It, it got a it got a double nomination. Yeah, and it is filthy. Yeah, yeah, we've got to we've got to have a look at that, Jace. But it was also for a long time the the biggest selling car for Ford in America. Well, there you go. America's got the, some the, the, killer the, taste. The, that they? wasn't a that wasn't America, a pickup What truck? happened with American cars? Like early muscle cars are awesome. Yeah, and then they went through that period of a so did we. There's that road yep. So that's when cars were like, hey, this retro thing's working. It's for almost us. got potential. But yeah. Yeah, and then the Saab that came up on yeah. a nomination, yeah. the Colt, Mitsubishi Colt, the um, Cube. Yep, yeah. they're tr- very popular in Japan yeah. though. And exactly. the one twenty Y got a nomination. Yeah, mud flaps made it ugly. But see another bland, boring car, that, the Nissan Maxima, I think it is. Yeah. Just a, phew, there's the Saab again. But there you've got to find that Taurus. Yeah. It's it's maroon in the slides. Yeah, no, not that maroon. No. Oh no. The Taurus, people will know. Yeah, so it had that long sloping front bonnet and, and the funny sort and the of back window that looked like a fishbowl. Yeah, isn't that? I, I was watching a cafe racer story the other day, and they've got a mathematical formula on how to build something yeah. in proportion. They clearly did not use no, that when it d- comes to the definitely Taurus. not. No. Yeah. There's there's <laughs> some vehicle manufacturers that are very guilty of not using that formula. I'm going to nominate 
my yep. my ugliest car, and we might get Jace to throw down on this. So we got third. I'm, I'm going to say I've got to just completely remove myself from any of the performance aspects. I'm going to say. So we're only picking from these, or yeah, you could throw it. No, throw up a couple other nominations. So we're going to throw the roller in. Yeah. Okay, rollers in there. Especially and the Taurus. I'm going to go the Taurus. Yep. Even though we haven't got a photo, can we can we Google a Taurus? Ford Taurus. T a u r s. Ford Taurus. That's the latest one. Yeah, no, we're talking back. like a nineties one. That, there you go. There it is. That's the one. And that's a good angle. No, go the long board. The yeah, that one. Yeah. Now that that is ugly. Look at the front of that. Yeah. It looks like a cartoon character yeah. of like someone with a bad nose. So I'm going on that for number one. Yep, yeah, me too. You I'm too. Gonna, I'm going to piss you off and go with the walking shore. Yeah, the walking shore. <laughs> All right, we'll say the walking shore is next up then. So we've got, we've got Taurus is one. Race me all you want. Taurus is one. Yep, Taurus is number one for me. So walking shore. You got, a, you got a second nomination? Yeah, the Rolls Royce. The for, roller. The Rolls Royce. Can you the, bring a photo of the roller up, Jase? That was the one that we were looking at before, the yeah, four-wheel drive. Yeah, I'm sorry when I'm spending 600 odd grand on a car you want it to be good looking well you'd like to think based on that I have to agree with you yeah, yeah. there's just no rear end of it like it just the car stops yeah it's, it's like a, it's, it's like an 8 year old kid and a slide ruler have, was in charge of the design process yes yeah yeah I've seen some of those drawings I like the Bentley SUV though yeah the Bentley's okay they did a good job of that yeah one. so we've got Taurus 1 Roller 2 so that's still the walking show still got a nomination. Is that going to get knocked off by anything? Uh, it's probably not. It's got to get knocked off by the Citroen. The Citroen, yeah. Oh, hang on. Sanyon Stavic. Yeah, the, yeah, the, 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 the Sanyon anything. If you had to be seen in a yep. Sanyon Stavic or a walking yeah. show, regardless Who of its reputation. Sorry? Who buys that car? Stevie Wonder. <laughs> 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 nice. So we can't... The Stavic in three. Yep. All right. Walking Shore still on the table. We've got P76, PT Cruiser, Volvo, Nimbus. Nimbus yeah, is pretty ordinary. Yeah, the little Nimbus is pretty ordinary. All right. Nimbus in four. Nimbus in four. P76. It's got to yep. be in there, isn't P7, it? Yeah. In five. Who haven't we done yet? We've still got the D. We've got the, the Walking Shore, the D. Oh, sorry. The AU Falcon. AU Falcon. Now, AU Falcons. I drive an AU Falcon before I drive a P76. Yeah. AU Falcon in six. Citron. Got to be getting down there. Seven. Yeah. Oh, hang on. Oh, the Pity Cruiser. The Pity Cruiser. Pity. Well, I'm, I'm controversial on the Pity in eight. I think it could be in seven over the Citron. Yeah, I have to have a reshuffle. Yeah. yeah Pity. PT Cruiser in seven. Citron in eight. See the whole that Citroen in the whole Art Deco sort of yeah, sort of yeah, stuff. It's almost it's, you could see it in an yeah, Art Deco I museum. Oh, you'd have yeah. to get a tattoo on your chest and the, yeah, well, you got the beard. <laughs> yeah, it is definitely a it's definitely a um, hipster car. Oh yeah, so, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. Uh, Walking Shaw. Oh, eight fifties. The Volvo's got to go. Yeah, in the there, Volvo. Right? Volvo and Volvo and nine. Mate, there's got to be a couple. Of, what were those other nominations yeah. that we didn't have? Oh, the Saab. The Saab and the um, the Cube. Yeah, the Little Nissan Cube. Well, Saab in 10. So are we pushing the walking shore out of the top 10? Yeah. Yeah. Saab in, Saab's in 10. Volvo 9, Vol- Saab 10. There's our top 10. Okay, ready? Yeah. Taurus in one. Ford Taurus. Yep. Strong contender there. Woo. The Roller, the $600,000 money not well spent Roller. Then the Stavic, the Sanyon Stavic, or Sanyon anything, three. The Nimbus, Mitsubishi Nimbus in four. P76 in five. AU Falcon in six. The PT, better known as the Pity. Pity, Take yep. Pity on that. And in seven. The Citroen, the hipster's car of choice in eight. And the Volvo Wagon in nine. The Saab in ten. Yep. Solid. Yep. Look, I'll publish those on um, social media and open to some more suggestions. But, hey, we've got to start somewhere. I haven't seen a good Australian top 10 ugly cars. Yeah. It was, I Googled it. Yep. Some cars came up, but not a solid top nah. 10. So if you didn't nominate, it's too late. Yep. You can get in later. Uh, mate, that was fun. That was good fun. Thanks for having me. There's a million things we didn't cover. <laughs> Always is at the end of these shows. Um, 
we will catch up again. We'll talk Definitely. a bit more about it. Two wheeling. Two wheeling special. Two wheeling special. So you, guys, make, you make it happen. So Guys Garage essentially is anch- we're anchoring the, the YouTube channel with these podcasts. And then I just sort of drop in sort of some fun stuff in between. So this yeah. two wheel challenge, Luffy and, and Guy for charity, will be coming up next. So thanks, mate. Good thanks, to have buddy. You in. Oh, guys, did you see my new shirts? I like the shirt. That's cool. I've got a few different shirts. I just yeah. had the black and white ones. Yeah. Oh, I'll stand up a bit. Check that out if you, you're not you're on. You just trying to show off your big chest. <laughs> <laughs> Stop sucking in. <laughs> and relax now. So yeah, I've got three different designs. So uh, yeah, check them out. And don't forget to follow us on social media and subscribe on that YouTube channel. And we'll be out on uh, iTunes soon. Hey, Jace. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Apple, bro. Uh, yeah, Apple. Come on, Apple. Let's get on iTunes. Okay, thanks, mate. Good to see you, buddy. Thanks for listening, guys. And uh, stay tuned for the next episode.